A lot of leaders and innovators talk about disrupting healthcare, but what does that really mean? And how does one actually do it? On Life-Centered Healthcare, we dive into these questions and more, talking to innovators who are leveraging Clay Christensen's theories to transform our healthcare ecosystem. I'm Ann Summers Hogg, Senior Research Fellow of Healthcare at the Clayton Christensen Institute, and I hope these stories help inspire you along your journey to transform health and care. I'm thrilled for today's conversation because I could not imagine a better guest with whom to discuss the future of healthcare. Zaina Kayat, health futurist at Deloitte Life Sciences and Healthcare in Canada, adjunct faculty at the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management and former vice president at Teladoc Health Canada, is here with us today. And before these roles, Zaina served as the future strategist with SE Health, She served as the Innovation Sherpa-in-Chief to strengthen the Dutch health innovation ecosystem. She led the Health System Innovation Platform at Mars Discovery District, a major innovation hub in Toronto, and much, much more. She completed her PhD in biochemistry and also had a career in strategy consulting as a principal in BCG's health practice. Welcome, Zaina. Thank you so much for being here. Great to be here, Anne. Excited about this podcast. Thank you. Thank you. And I gave a brief overview of your background, but before we dive in, I'd love to give you the opportunity to tell our listeners a little bit more about you. So I'd like to start with why. Could you tell us a little bit why about after four years as the first ever and perhaps the only futurist in a large national home care agency you made the move to a commercial leadership role in the Canadian arm of Teladoc Health. What drove you to join Teladoc? What attracted you to this organization and their approach? So my why is I think my personal mission is to improve the health of Canadians. With the platform I have, my lever to do that is by modernizing the Canadian health and care system. And so when the opportunity to bring the Teladoc platform into Canada as part of an acquisition they did a few years ago, you know, it gave permission to enter the market, This is the platform to bring modern solutions at population scale that already have proven to work elsewhere. And so I kind of had to jump on board because I think that's, at least in our market, has been the lock and the key is lots of point solutions and pretty good, neat ideas, but nothing really done at scale. And that's that's the next unfinished business. Awesome. I love that. Modern solutions at population scale. I think that's what so many startups in the healthcare ecosystem are striving for right now. Many are promising, few will deliver. So exciting to see Teladoc make progress in that area. Now, more recently, you also became the in-house futurist with Deloitte Healthcare in Canada. Tell our listeners what that is all about. As a change maker in healthcare, I've got two levers. One is rolling up my sleeves and doing the work. And that's what I've done in every job you just listed earlier and what I'm doing now with Teladoc. And it's hard and it's punishing. You got to be in it near the clinicians and near the patients and with the tech people and the contracting people, et cetera. The other lever is to actually build capacity for others to do that. And that's what I do through my teaching at the university, also with the Dutch Health Innovation School, which I continue to teach in. And then now is this role with Deloitte where I can bring thinking about the future into the work they do, our own staff and our clients, so that at least some big choices and bets people are going to make today are consistent with an ever-evolving future. And I don't think we do that enough when we make big bets today. So that's my vector for scale there in capacity building. I like how you broke it into the two different levers to pull. So you're either the change maker on the ground doing the hard punishing work on the front lines, or you're building the capacity for others to do it. And you're really teaching and leading. But what I love about your roles is that you're doing both, which will make you a better capacity builder because you can talk about how it's truly done on the ground and speak about it with firsthand experience. Exactly. One informs the other and vice versa. And I'll tell you, and I never knew this until I reflected. So I teach in our global MBA program and I, you know, we've got these doctors and CEOs that come through and Six months after one of my lectures, one of our, you know, graduating students will come to me and say, Zaina, because of you, because of this one class, I took this trajectory and now this is happening. I think I've had more impact on my mission, which is impacting the health of Canadians (laughs) through that than any of my on the ground work, if I have to be honest. So I hold both very dear to my heart and they do feed off each other. That's great to see the the return on investment and in the capacity building so quickly. 
We could talk about your background and your experience for the entirety of the podcast. And I find your roles so interesting. And I know our our listeners will too. But I do want to dive into our topic at hand here and talk about how we're seeing healthcare in the home and virtual care really grow. And what are the levers or propellers to that growth? So pre-pandemic, telehealth and virtual care were already taking off. And in our COVID world, we just saw this accelerate. It was fuel on the fire and really gave it the momentum and the push that it needed to grow. Hospital at home models, remote patient monitoring solutions, and home-based care all grew rapidly. So from your point of view, what are some of the most innovative business models in the space today? So maybe before I share the models, and, and I agree there was fertile ground for some experiments to scale, you know, I, I would just be clear, in my view, the word home is really care anywhere. You know, if you're a truck driver and there's millions of them, your home is your truck. If you're an adolescent in high school, your home is your school. It's just this idea of untethering one place called the facility from care as being the only channel (laughs) and then really uh, decentralizing, which was, you know, a big thesis, as you know, of Christensen's original uh, book about this, you know, massive decentralization that's coming. It's just the home is one of those places that doesn't have traditionally a lot of infrastructure for, you know, much more higher acuity care, like the examples you gave. And I know, and you even talk about them. I'll, I'll just call out three and then we can get into them. You know, I really love what Dispatch is doing, you know, started in uh, Colorado and now they're in multiple states of the idea of an ER to home. You know, whereas most health systems have diverted people from coming to the ER or getting them out as fast as possible, they're literally bringing the ER level care into the home using humans and machines. And I just think to me what that business model is about is a fundamentally inflexible infrastructure like building EDs, you know, for a the most dynamic thing in the world called ED care. <laughs> so making it flexible and, and, you know, asset light. I'm quite a fan of that model and I haven't seen that scaled in too many, well, really anywhere outside the US. I'm waiting for them to open a Canadian <laughs> branch. The second is, you know, maybe a lighter version of that, which I think has grown because of COVID, was always there, but is really getting creative, which is what I call telehospitalists. So, you know, these highly trained, high acuity resources that you need, particularly like things like stroke and critical care and ICU where like every minute is brain or a life and limb thing. And these places like in North America, with these big floppy geographies where there's just no way you're going to have the cadre of these experts in every place where bad things happen that are unexpected, like a stroke or a car accident or, you know, a gunshot wound, really being able to get that hospitalist or intensivist level expertise at the point of care without that person being in the room and laying eyes on them. And again, we're doing this and, you know, this is a big part of one of the platforms Teladoc enables that I was excited to bring to Canada you know, in very, very remote and rural areas of the world where our clinicians who are sitting behind the screen and, you know, manipulating these devices to see the patient, you know, who could be 6,000 kilometers away. I don't know what that is in miles. I don't even remember that I'm behind a video. They don't, like to them, they're in it and the, the outcomes are huge. So that's another one I think of just spreading capacity for hospitals, specialists, intensivists. And that includes for specialty referrals. We're doing this in the NHS in England for over 34 million patients. It's about the whole size of Canada. And then the final is like the new era of, you mentioned the word remote monitoring and <laughs> Just really much less clumsy and clunky, you know, really continuous and proactive monitoring enabled by payment models and care models that, you know, create value. So I'll just give a couple examples. You know, remote monitoring companies have been around for post-acute type monitoring because the incentives are very clear. You don't want to readmit. And there's a lot of risk in the first, you know, few days after a surgery or discharge. But with Teladoc, for example, with the chronic condition platform from the the Livongo acquisition, that platform has been working really well to decentralize care of chronic conditions, diabetes, hypertension, et cetera. But then recently we added last mile, we added do your A1C test at home. 
And so that just integrates another layer into this, which makes the value proposition higher. And that's what I'm seeing, these stacks and stacks of these home monitoring programs that are well beyond some devices measuring vitals. Awesome. Three really good examples. And I can say as someone who lives in a market where Dispatch Health operates, they are great. And if they do ever come to Canada, I would suggest using them. For listeners who may not be as familiar with them, Dispatch Health is urgent care that comes to your house. When they first launched, their tagline was urgent care in the back of a Prius. So they've eliminated the bricks and mortar of urgent care and they send a nurse practitioner and a tick technician to your house and can basically provide all the services that you would need that you might need or could get in an urgent care. Even if you need an x-ray, they will send portable x-ray to your home, which is awesome. So very asset light model, definitely an innovator worth watching. And I find it interesting in how they have actually pivoted their business model from originally just being direct to consumer to actually partnering with health systems here in the U.S. They've partnered with health systems, which helps Dispatch Health make their market larger and also helps the health system should this individual need care that Dispatch Health can't provide. I'd love to dive into one thing you said about the new era of remote monitoring and how the work Teladoc is doing with last mile, you said you can now do your A1C test at home. So we're really seeing not just these point solutions of remote monitoring or home-based care, but truly an integrated approach to disease management. Could you talk a little bit more about what that partnership with last mile looks like and perhaps from the consumer perspective the benefit they get out of it. So, I mean, this was announced maybe last year. And again, we don't have this yet in Canada. That's a big part of why I came to Teladoc is to bring the platform. There's nothing like it in uh, our country. And I thought, wow, I get to be part of bringing that. So I've had my eye on this for a while. And, you know, my PhD is in diabetes. And I left academia because I was like, the papers I'm publishing are never going to impact anybody with diabetes in this country. And I thought, wow, if I could bring Livongo. And then when I saw this A1C announcement, you know, because I know that's a big gap in care is just getting the A1C test. So I think this was our partnership with Let's Get Checked, which is, you know, a company already doing that. And just like you said, just like Dispatch, it's much easier to attach to an existing platform that has a population it serves versus going after it alone for a point solution. So that's just an example of that. If you think about it, you know, if you even look at Teladoc's roots or any other virtual care, we were already doing this for 20 years with home delivery of medications, right? So you do a virtual care appointment, you know, some percent of the time, the result is a medication as part of the treatment plan. And then just with an algorithm, you pick the pharmacy and it's a home delivery service and they deliver the drugs to your house. Like that's last mile. It's just, we don't think about that because it's been part of our infrastructure. And of course, Amazon will put that on steroids with <laughs> with the pill pack acquisition. So this is just, you know, another version of that where diagnostic testing, again, thanks to COVID, is now coming to the home, whether that's cassette type point of care testing where, you know, you put the specimen on some device and you, you get your result immediately or even phlebotomy at home, urine sampling at home, where at least you're not going to the collection center. It's coming to you in a logistics and cost effective way that makes the economics work. So so that's the idea. And, and I think what I like about bolting on the home A1C to the chronic condition model of Teladoc, which has already six or seven innovations in one, right? I think I had my students once analyze it through the Doblin innovation lens and it kicks off like seven of the 10. There's devices getting biological data. We're mailing the test strips to your house. So you don't have to add that as a barrier to your thing. We have an AI as your partner looking at your data and giving just in the moment nudges. There's a human coach that's got your back all the time. Like there's so many pieces. And then, but one gap in care is A1C testing. And now we've taken that barrier away, right? And the meds already were there and the link to primary care is already built into the program uh, through the merger, obviously with Teladoc. So, so that's all. It just takes the next one. And I'll tell you, what will be next is the two other big gaps in care with people with diabetes is getting their eyes checked and checking their feet. And if we can close those gaps in care, then we're going to really have an even more holistic solution. So we'll see what comes next with that. Very exciting. 
And I say that as not an incumbent healthcare operator. So what do you think makes any of these models that you mentioned innovators worth watching? What makes them potentially disruptive to the incumbents out there? So I'd say a few things I'd observe, and this is more my lens of, you know, I was on the the partnering side. So I was that, you know, org that had to partner with these tech companies because we didn't have the capabilities, even though in my former org as St. Elizabeth Healthcare, you know, we were delivering care in people's homes 10,000 times a day for like 118 years. I mean, this was our, our core business and we didn't have the capabilities to have a platform that can adjust and pivot everything, the tech stack, the data stack, the payment models. So I think that's to me what makes these innovators worth watching. One is just really thinking ahead and not being locked in on anything so that you can keep evolving both in real time and for the future. And I think the second thing is being able to partner really, really well. It's an art and a little bit of science and not many on both sides the innovators or like the health system partners are very good at this and finding out the gives and the takes and the scalable models. So I think that's what I see that works really well. And then finally, because you're going into people's homes, it's the Wild West. I mean, healthcare has been in such an institutional and clinic based model where we can control all the conditions, the light, the temperature, the hours of operation, who's there, where they go. We have a security guard that'll kick you out if you don't behave. The home is like the dog is going to be humping your leg. You're going to slip on the ice when you're getting to the door. The person won't answer the door, even though they said they'd be there. Like, so many things are going on. So you really, really need people who know how to be in the home. And that's why formal health systems have to partner. And these new startups who don't get this will not make it. Great insights. And I'm going to tie them all together through the business model lens. So the first one, effectively, these startups have nimble business models. They're not locked into the incumbent approach to businesses. They are fast, flexible, and responsive because they're focused on what's needed for the future, not what's led to their success in the past. You also pointed to some key processes and key resources. So from the partnership lens... People need or these organizations have processes and associated resources required to partner with the health systems that they want to work with or other entities that they need to work with. And then the importance of having flexible resources who are okay not being in control in order to go into the home and succeed. I had never thought about the juxtaposition between the environment and healthcare. You're right, because... In the healthcare facility, from a supply side, everything is controlled. So the provider has control over every detail you mentioned. And in the home, it's the exact opposite. You are walking into a situation in which you have no control at all. No control. And it'll change day to day. And just to add to that, there's a whole other area of talk and thinking and rethinking medical education. So med school, nursing school, physiotherapy school, because... If you look at the applied hours, like the practicum hours that say a nursing student goes through, like 99% of that is at a hospital, but 99% of health is created, made and destroyed everywhere but a hospital. So these clinical resources are not trained in the native environment where their patients, where all the action is and where it's going, everything we just talked about. So there's a whole movement there where I think home-based training is having a renaissance. So it's going to start to disrupt, I think, med ed. Just one other point looking at, you went through the business model lens. So profit model, one of the the key elements, you know, and I don't know the answer, but maybe Anne, you can think about it. If you think about what happens when you move traditionally facility-based care models into a home setting, you know, you've now, you've changed the economics because you've downloaded the cost of the physical place to the patient. It's their electricity, it's their water, you know, it's their real estate. So, so that should allow you to whatever, stop building hospitals or, you know, streamline your clinics or whatever, just like remote work. However, that cost can be a big cost. Like if you're going to start to do dialysis at home at the rate that it can be done, which is about 40% of all dialysis theoretically can be done at home. There's a big cost to be born of that, of supplies being stored and blah, blah, blah. On the other hand, you're adding a cost that used to be on the patient, which is travel. They came to you. 
they parked. Now you've got to pay for getting these people to these places. And in a big floppy geography, that's a very big cost. I mean, I personally have a relative who works in home care. When gas prices got really bad recently, she was net negative income from a day of work, just from filling up her car twice in a day. So that aspect of the fleet, if you will, becomes a very big part of your cost model, not just the labor going into the home and their hours of work. And I don't think these companies that are in Last Mile understand those economics very well, particularly given the kind of geographies we're talking about. That's an excellent point. When you think about the scaling perspective, it might work really well in a small pilot where your geography is really tight and you're the number of people that you're serving is really small. But as you seek to scale it, how does the profit model continue to work or not? I think the biggest thing I thought of when you mentioned profit model was the reimbursement side. So in the US, a big reason why home-based care did not catch on before the pandemic in the way that it did during the pandemic is it wasn't reimbursed. It wasn't paid for. Now, during the pandemic, there were waivers that changed that, which made the business model economics work. But you're right, the profit model component is going to be key for many of these potential disruptors and new entrants who are seeking to capture share in the market to figure out. Because if they can't do that sustainably, they won't be around long. Yeah, I think there's lots of pools, though, of financing. Just like you said, it's in the interest of big payers like a Medicare to pay for more things to be in the, you know, in the envelope, if you will. And that certainly happened and that's driving a market. I think the other two drivers though of a market is everyday people will pay out of pocket for this. It might be not be the 85 year old person, but it'll be their son or daughter, <laughs> you know, because there's a cost to them if their, you know, loved one isn't uh, aging well at home. So that market's exploding because a baby boomer was born every 10 seconds and it's still on its way up. So that's, there's a whole world of that economy. And then the third is there's budgets of, let's say, a hospital itself that has incentives to not have readmissions or whatever, where you can use their OPEX that would have financed, you know, an ER room or an operating room or a lab or whatever, like the OPEX can pay for the home care. So it's part of the extended budget, if you will, of an incumbent versus asking some, you know, insurer to reimburse a task. It's just, it's part of the episode of care. So that's how these models, at least in Canada, have really taken off actually that last bucket, that last bucket. And to that point, the U.S. certainly has some unique payment structures compared to other countries. And because of that, a number of these virtual and at-home care models have not taken off the way they perhaps have in other countries. So what do you think the U.S. can learn from other countries' approaches to home-based care? Are there other home-based models you've seen succeed elsewhere that you think we should really look to? It's One thing is interesting, this is definition. So there's home care, And I think in the U.S., the the words are home health is different from home care. If I remember from a definition, one involves nurses, one involves, you know, home health aides or something like that. Whereas in, in most places in the world, home care is any combination of, you know, a licensed professional like a nurse, an RN or an RPN, physiotherapist, or somebody that's helping with activities of daily living, like the equivalent of what you'd call a home health aid. It's any combination of those. Rehab, occupational therapy is home health care. So that is a difference, I'd say, because you're not siloing the kind of human help you need. And then it makes it a little bit easier because now you can mix and match. I would separate that, though, from home-based care models like we've been talking about, like ER at home and hospital to home, because those often don't even use the traditional home health care agency people. It's, it's all these other new entrants, right? So, so they're just, there's, there's two things at play. Just a, a couple examples that I've been tracking around the world. So one big movement is this idea of client directed care. So instead of some third party agency or assessor or insurance, you know, adjudicator <laughs> saying, okay, you qualify for this many days of a nurse coming over or a home health aide or whatever. And here's the price and here's the minutes. And to this shift to, you know, based on your level of need and support you have at home, here's your budget and you go and buy whatever you need. And if, if what you need is a person to cut your lawn, it's in scope. <laughs> you know, uh, Medicare did that a little bit, but this is really client-directed care or it's called patient budgets. 
so a couple jurisdictions in Canada have now done this. The probably the most advanced is Nova Scotia. Australia was really one of the first, and Germany years ago to have these kind of patient budgets, and they get the money, they get the envelope, they go find what they need. Now you have no intermediaries, and you have a big incentive for you know the people who del- del- deliver the services to actually do well. <laughs> so, what are their results? What becomes of this? Are health outcomes better? Or costs lower? What- it's a great question. So I don't know that there's been great analysis, but I'd say the biggest benefit has been two things. I'd say one is definitely better client experience or patient experience because they're directing, they're in charge. The worst thing when you're getting home health care is to be stuck with whoever and they don't match you. Like it's not a fit, whatever language or I don't know what. And then you're kind of stuck with them because you'd rather have that than no care. So when you can decide and direct who, when, and what, it's just much better patient choice. So I think that's indisputable. And then, of course, formal health systems like it because they're now absolved from all the bureaucracy and organization of managing and micromanaging these resources, which is very, very, it's another layer of management that uh, adds cost. And they're so far away from the patient. They're making decisions about these people's lives. They never see them, you know? So I I think it's consistent with that. I, I don't know that the results have yet been quantified, but the fact that they keep going probably is a good sign. A couple other examples. So this idea of a nursing home at home In the U.S., it got a lot of momentum of the skilled nursing facilities or SNFs at home. And so this idea that if you're a nursing home, like you can't build it, you can't grow. Like if you're full, that's it. Like it's going to take you 10 years for CapEx to build another building. So how do you scale and grow? So so either the nursing home themselves building the model or others doing it and then competing, if you will, with a nursing home. But the data shows 20 to 25 percent of people in a nursing home could manage at home with appropriate supports. That's a pretty huge market. And at least in Canada, 16 percent of people using a hospital bed right now do not belong in a hospital, but there's nowhere for them to go because we don't have a care model that fits. And so there's just these new models of what I call nursing home at home. And in my former job, you know, we were rolling these out and literally bringing people home from hospital who didn't need to be at hospital with a new model. And we were what we call reactivating them, which is getting them kind of back to their pre-hospital baseline in like 35 days. These are extremely high. These people would have been sitting in the hospital for six months or whatever until they died. So high, high ROI business models that, again, don't have a scalarator yet. They're point solutions, but they work. A couple of other uh, ones I'll just call out just to throw the whole buffet out. I don't know if you've heard of NORCs, N-O-R-C, NORCs, Naturally Occurring Retirement Centers. So this is idea in like urban environments. You've got, you know, large multi-resident apartment buildings that just skew elderly. So as soon as you tip 35% of the residents are over 65, you're a naturally occurring retirement center. Like just by volume, (laughs) there's just people who have a lot of need who will self-aggregate and do their own programming like a retirement center or an assisted living facility. So, So in an oxymoron, instead of them being naturally occurring, there's now support from health systems to actually let them become like a retirement center. And the cost is like $10 a day. And that's contrasted with, I don't know, a retirement home can be $300 a day (laughs) or $500 a day. So so that's a big thing actually out of Canada that the world has come to study. And there's a lot of infrastructure now to scale the NORC model, which is kind of cool. And then maybe just a couple more, and then you ask me questions, family caregivers. So, you know, the son or the daughter or the spouse who's taking care of the loved one who needs home supports, becoming like part of the patient unit of care and having a whole set of programs, services, infrastructure, policies, payment models to support them. Because as soon as they go down, everything goes down. And so why don't you intervene then? There's a huge movement and, you know, places like Sweden pay in an allowance for a family caregiver. A lot more employers are now creating a benefit for family caregivers et cetera, et cetera. So that's a whole market that's exploding and solutions are coming up. So anyway, those are just some examples. Thank you for sharing those. And just when I thought I'd heard all of the healthcare acronyms, 
Now I have a new one, Norks. So just one quick follow-up question on that one. In these retirement centers, are health systems placing nurses and providers with in the centers? How where's the healthcare tie-in? Yeah. So what they've done, and that's been, you know, studied and evaluated as what's the best model to make a naturally occurring retirement center not naturally occurring, <laughs> is to actually place a coordinator in the building that is the liaison both of internally volunteer-based programming and activities. There's always a room or a space for these so that you could have like a, you know, a meds clinic, a diabetes clinic, a cardiac, whatever. So there's space, there's a coordinator, and then they're the liaison out. So if it turns out that in this building, you know, 35 people need some nursing care in the home or they need some phlebotomy to get, you know, lab work, then they can coordinate and have one provider come in and do the whole building versus the old way, which is literally a revolving door. Like sometimes we looked at some of these buildings, 35 different providers coming in and out of the building every day. So really streamlines. And then you get a longitudinal relationship, of course, as well between those providers and the residents of the building. So that's a huge cost savings for Canada because they're sending one provider instead of 35. Yeah. And you have continuity of care because the turnover of these providers is very high. (laughs) So I'm saying, I think they quantified about 10 bucks a day for this program. And a typical, like if you were just getting traditional home care that got assessed by some, you know, remote person and nobody really follows the data, it could be anywhere from 30 to $150 a day. And then, you know, a hospital stays like 1500 to 3000 a day. So you could see the economics multiply pretty quickly. Yes, very quickly indeed. So Zaina is very clear from this conversation. You're a visionary. So let's look to the future. Pretend we're having a similar conversation again, but it's three years from now. So it's 2026. Which innovative business models will be thriving and which ones will be struggling? So let me just unpack that in some of the different vectors of at home that are happening. So I think any of the more traditional medical care at home, emergent care, as we talked about, primary care at home, physio, rehab, palliative you know, post-acute care, I think those will just be business as usual business models. I think lengths of stay in acute facilities will be almost nothing. There'll be a few hours and this will just be how it's done. And I think that it'll be that good that it'll be on an outcomes-based model. So some kind of a, you know, if you think of Christensen, you know, VAP, value-add process type model, just because we'll have the numbers. I think the coordination and the communication to enable at-home models, so omni-channel, everyone on the same page, sharing the data, I don't have as much confidence that's going to be where it needs to be because of all the fragmentation. And I certainly don't know how next modalities, like right now we can barely deal with app, phone, text, and video, <laughs> but voice and VR and, you know, teleholoportation, like these things are coming on and, and I don't think we'll be there. So I still think it's going to be a fragmented experience and it's going to be patchwork of interoperability. That's my guess from what I'm seeing today. I think diagnostics at home is going to explode. So all this last mile is going to be so much better than what it even is today. You know, we we basically take blood and urine from people. I think those are going to be very old ways (laughs) to get information about one's biology. Uh, But what I am not sure about is, will it still be a bunch of discrete tests like sleep apnea, eyes, you know, fertility, all these, you know, each with a different company? Well, that's not going to work. So I don't know what will be combined and not, but I think a lot of that will happen at home. I think it's going to be a big change of life for all your labs providers and central kind of diagnostics. I don't think imaging at home will take off as much as I'd love to see it. I think, you know, in theory, you could do MRI at home, but that's, you know, colonoscopy at home. But I don't think the business models are ready or the incumbent's going to hang on way too tight. There's too much fixed infrastructure. (laughs) So I wish I saw that, but I don't think so. And then finally, procedures at home, like chemotherapy, dialysis, IV infusions. I think those will just kind of follow along with labs and imaging and uh, diagnostics. I I just think we really don't need to be bringing people to buildings for this stuff anymore. And I think those business models will fall out. Last thing is, you know, the headlines for years were the end of hospitals, the de-hospitalization of healthcare, (laughs) you know, homespital is like another word, right? I don't know. I mean, from everywhere I see, other than one country, maybe two, Denmark and Netherlands, maybe the UK a little bit, 
the number one policy agenda is build more hospitals. So that's what I'm struggling with is how can this whole movement be happening? Yet, you know, these long term capital bets are still all about building more. So so I'm not sure if hospitals will be shut down in most markets, although a few countries, that is the policy agenda. I love the the vision of what's to come, especially around at home diagnostics exploding and your comment that it can't continue to be a bunch of discrete tests. There will have to be combination and just the resulting business model change that that will mean for lab services. We'll see more procedures at home and we likely will not see the end of hospitals. Awesome. Zaina, thank you so much. My last question for you is, do you have any parting thoughts that you'd like to leave with the audience about the future of home-based and virtual care? So maybe just a couple of things. Anderson Horowitz's thesis for this year is healthcare is leaving the building. I thought that was interesting. You know, your VCs and your PE funds are saying, you know, it's a land grab for the home. So there is a lot of center of gravity moving here. And I, so I'll just leave with two points. One is, you know, again, to me, it's about care anywhere. It's not necessarily the home. You know, home is a feeling, you know, feeling comfortable, feeling safe. And you don't feel that usually in facilities. So it's that's what I would be thinking about is care anywhere. And then finally, as I mentioned, you know, all these new entrants that are coming in, whether they're, you know, a big grocer or, or an Instacart or a new startup, you know, if they get logistics, that's what's going to make or break it at scale. And they can either disrupt, but as you've mentioned, they can also partner because the incumbents really, really need these capabilities and they do not have them in-house. So double opportunity. Fabulous. I love your concept of the care anywhere. It's not just the home, but it's really care anywhere. And that gets back to really meeting people where they are in the flow of their lives because the hospital is, I would venture to say, never in the flow of anyone's life. So I'm excited for this future that you've painted for us, Zaina. And thank you so much for coming to speak with me today and for sharing all of your insights with our listeners. My pleasure. I think you're going to be very busy, Anne and team, uh, evaluating these business models when they start to pop. (laughs) Thank you. You are certainly right about that. Well, thank you so much, Zena. And thank you, listeners, for tuning in to hear Zena share her insights of the future of healthcare. Until next time. Thank you for listening to Life Centered Healthcare. If you like what you heard, please leave a review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you're listening. And for more of the latest in healthcare, check out our website, christiansoninstitute.org. You can sign up for our newsletter and read our latest industry insights. Until next time, have a wonderful day, everyone.